Hello, everybody. Welcome. Good afternoon. This is Ascenders Real Talk. Pitch it till you make it. My name is Anya Lehmann, Innovation Director here at Ascender. For those of you who are new to Ascender, just wanted to quickly tell you a little bit more about us. Uh, Ascender is Pittsburgh's community for entrepreneurs. We offer educational programming that happens twice a month. Uh, we have a business incubator. Um, we offer mentorship, expert coaching, uh, and then also run an entrepreneur focused co working space located near Bakery Square. For more information about our co working space, make sure that you locate the chat box because we'll be sharing information about that. So, the next time, uh, or next, just wanted to quickly go over a few announcements. So our next Real Talk will be Tuesday, May 25th. Um, May's, or May's theme is on designing for disruption. So it will be all about how do you design products that people love, you know? So anything from learning, you know, how to prototype, how to do customer discovery, uh, you know, in a virtual setting to also learning how to pilot test. So we have a lot of things um, packaged for May uh, and you can find all of that information in our programs page, as well as, you know, resources and our upcoming events. Uh, our next Real Talk will be, um, will we'll feature Tomer Borenstein, co-founder and CTO of Blastpoint, as well as another guest who will be, who we will be announcing moving forward. So to get us started today, uh, I want to introduce our executive director, Nandili Nunez, who will be introducing our guests uh, and leading the facilitated conversation today from all of the questions that you sent. So I'm gonna hand it over to you, Nandili. Thank you, thank you. Welcome everyone. You know, I'm looking at Jennifer Price's video and I feel like I made the wrong decision of leading this call indoors. This <laughs> looks like fabulous. I, yeah, you may drop a pin or something. Uh, all right, so let's get started. I have two really great guests. George, we've known for a while, and if you've been in the entrepreneurship scene, you've seen him a lot uh, through Innovation Works and just being a contributor to the community and helping other entrepreneurs build their business. And Gabby, she's she's been around for a while, but she's been secret, secretly selling, building, and then selling two companies. She's got two exits under her belt. So I think we've got two wonderful people uh, here to have a conversation about pitching. So uh, with that, I'm going to ask George and Gabby to introduce themselves. George, you can go first and you can also start um, every, every event we do or every real talk we do a speed round. Because, you know, we've all been to these like panel conversations and then it just gets three questions answered because everyone wants to tell a long story. Well, the speed round is like, let's get you some quick facts by constraining our guests to just complete a sentence. Don't give me a story, just complete the sentence to best help you. All right, so for the first one, George, introduce yourself and then say over my X number of years, our honeycomb, I've given how many pitches? Okay, yeah, so hi, hi I'm George Cook. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Honeycomb Credit. Uh, Honeycomb is a loan crowdfunding platform, so we let locally owned small businesses borrow from their own customers and fans. Uh, you can think about us kind of like Indiegogo, but instead of donating 100 bucks and getting a t-shirt, you're investing in your favorite coffee shop or, or small business uh, and earning a nice return while, while helping out a local small business owner. Uh, in the three, a little over three years I've been running Honeycomb, I have probably pitched about 2,000 times. <laughs> So not not exaggerating, <laughs> including including kind of uh, elevator intro pitches, absolutely about 2,000 times, about two a day. Wow, two a day, I think that's a good good framework. Well, my condolences. So <laughs> Gabby, for you, you know, if you're putting together the years you were in these two companies, well, introduce yourself, and then in the two, uh, in, the, in the years with the two companies that you sold, how many pitches do you think you gave? Yeah, I'm um, Gabby. Uh, stories. I'm um, a serial entrepreneur. Like Nadili said, uh, I, uh, the founder. Uh, I was the founder of uh, two, uh, you know, fast-growing SaaS companies. One, Electronic Billing. It was acquired by Thomson Reuters, and the second one was Belfield, and it was acquired by uh, Roper Technology. In the um, real quick, right? Um, I haven't counted it. Uh, but I, I, I pitch for life. So um, uh, how many probably, you know, I didn't do the math, right? 
But uh, but yeah, probably uh, pitching every day because I mean, for me, pitching is uh, selling, selling yourself, selling to your vendors. So um, yeah, at least um, 360 a day, uh, a year. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's a really good uh, segue to the next speed round because it depends on what you're selling, right? So, uh, how many versions of your pitch do you, did you have or do you have? And what are if you were to narrow it down to your three main types, however way you separate them? So, how many versions of your pitch? And if it's ten, what are your top three that you would use? George, how about you go first? Sure. So. Dozens of versions of the pitch, probably kind of five commonly used versions uh, of the three most common. Uh, so the investor pitch, of course, uh, is up there in the top three. Probably the one I use most is just kind of the, I call it the long elevator pitch. It's kind of the one to two minutes of myself and, and Honeycomb. Uh, and then the third is probably kind of a generic, it's, it's kind of a five to 10 minute generic pitch to stakeholders, people I want to become referral partners, um, people that are in the small business ecosystem who don't necessarily, aren't necessarily going to be buyers of my product, but who can be influencers for me. Fabulous. How long would you say is your investor pitch time-wise? Investor pitch is generally 15 to 20 minutes. Great. All right, Gabby, what about for you when you were doing those pitches that made them want to buy it out? How many versions of your pitch and what were your top three types? Um, I think there were like a three main uh, versions or a category. One was the super short, like a one to two minutes. Uh, you know, this is what we use, even what our employees uh, were trained to when they have to explain about the company. Uh, the second one was a little bit more like uh, uh, to uh, spark interest. Uh, that will be about uh, seven uh, to 10 minutes. And, um, and then the, the long pitch, um, I typically like to work on a 20, 30 minute and then uh, adapt it depending on the audience and the target. Fabulous, fabulous, that's great. So when it comes to slide decks, are you hashtag uh, team minimal words or hashtag team narrative? Definitely minimal words for me. I'm, I'm a visual person myself. So lots of visuals, lots of graphs. What about you, Gabby? Uh, minimum, minimum words. Okay, yes. great. And this is a place where, it, you know, if you two disagree, that's, that's an op this is an open space to disagree as well. Uh, so, but that's great. It looks like both minimal words. I think that's what we all aspire to have. So, the first line, so complete this for me, you know, my first line of each pitch was or is usually, what's your first sentence of your pitch? Gabby, um, yeah, uh, the first sentence is, hey, I'm Gabby Isturis, and thank you so much uh, for having me. I prepared this presentation for you, and I would love to make it interactive. Great. George, what about you? So for me, I'm, I'm a big believer in, in a founder market fit. So I usually start with my background. So I, I usually start with something like, hi, I'm George Cook. I am a sixth generation community banker. My family has been running a community bank for 130 years. And I noticed this problem and, and this is why I'm presenting to you. Fabulous. So in that same vein, what is your last line of your pitch? George, let's go backwards. So George, what's your last line? So I have, I, to Gabby's point, I'm really into kind of interactive pitches. So it's usually um, kind of opening the floor for questions. I try to make the pitch a little bit shorter and make it more, uh, more Q&A with the investors or, or whatever stakeholder. Okay. Gabby, what about you? Uh, thank you for your time. And uh, do we agree on the next steps? Ah, do you do we agree on the next steps? So make sure there's that follow up. It's just not thrown out there. Like, yes. all right, thanks. And what's yeah. that? No right. next, no, no next step. Uh, you don't know what's going to happen next, right? If we don't nail that. And we did receive a question about that, so we'll talk about that in a minute. Okay, true or false? Customer acquisition is usually part of my pitch. True. Gabby, what about for you? Uh, it depends on the type of pitch. So, I mean, if you're doing something uh, very short, 
right? Or even kind of like a medium, probably that is not the place to, you know, elaborate. But if you're doing an investor uh, pitch that it's a long pitch, absolutely. Uh, okay, fantastic. All right, the last one to complete is a multiple choice. So when I pitch or when I pitched, I would A, memorize or read a script, B, draft general talking points, or C, wing it. <laughs> yeah, you gotta go first with that last one, you gotta tell me. Yeah, I mean, uh, talking points, talking points. I'm, I'm all for uh, spontaneous uh, pitches and less rehearsed, which is hard to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I, I'm a B. I'm probably guilty of C from time to time, but but uh, definitely in the B camp. Uh, you know, defining those talking points and making sure you get through them. Did you start off that way? Because I think the more you give pitches, the easier it is for you to do talking points because you've done it enough. But when you think about when you first started or in the first year, let's say that you were doing this, were you more you were you still in the talking points category, or did you do more of a script? So I will say there have been kind of high pressure pitches. So thinking about like Alpha Lab demo day, it's a it, televised online, hundreds of people in the audience. That's a pitch where I was definitely uh, kind of new line by line what I wanted to, to say, uh, but also kind of rehearsed with those bulleted points as well, just to make sure like if I stumbled, I wasn't gonna lose my entire thread, but rather I, I kind of knew the t next talking point to move on to. So yeah, I'd say with experience, I've moved away from become less scripted, the more confident I've become with, with more practice. Mm, okay. Gabby, do you agree? Yeah, and uh, the, uh, I think uh, I believe that pitching it's, uh, it's an art. In the, in, it requires a lot of uh, work and preparation. So typically, right, uh, if I'm preparing uh, for a pitch, a presentation, uh, I do write everything up. Uh, it's kind of like a funnel and uh, where everything is uh, initially scripted. Uh, you know, and you gotta repeat, repeat, practice it. And then um, just to come naturally, um, I don't like to, 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 to read, uh, just going over the talking points that were already elaborated. So is that make sense? Yeah. No, I mean, that the, yeah, I mean, it, it's kind of like a, there is nothing uh, to be improvised, right? It's just having the talking points, knowing what you're going to talk about, right? Just coming a little bit more spontaneous. Right. But I think you're really good, Gabby, with just kind of coming in with the facts and you're very focused in the way of what you want to achieve in that conversation. I've been on the receiving end a lot of, of pitches and it just, it feels like they're going in this direction and that direction and this direction. And in that case, I sometimes recommend someone to write it down just to even get, just get the words out on paper, like a diary, and then start deleting a lot of things that they don't need to be telling me about that I don't really care. In, in, in even in my case, it's uh, a little bit of a storyboarding uh, process uh, that, you know, do kind of like a diagram, uh, you know, depending on your audience, how you want the flow to be, then kind of like a write the narrative and then kind of like a cut it down to, you know, what are the, the just as a reminder. So, so when you're talking about storyboarding, uh, that's always really interesting because you can read up on different pitch structures and everyone's going to say, start with the problem and then start with the market size, start with this. But if you see enough pitches, you see some people kind of start with the, after the problem, they start with the team or, you know, for George, he said, I'm a sixth generation banker. How did you decide after mentioning the problem in your pitch, decide what's the next slide? What's the next point? Is it the market size? Is it that your solution is the first of its kind? What is it? Yeah, I mean, I, I can go first. Uh, so I, I see the a pitch structure in kind of like a three phases. So uh, the, the first, and, and by the way, uh, the research indicates that after three minutes, if you don't capture the audience, you're done in your pitch. So, you know, uh, understanding that it's a 15, 20 minute pitch. So the three uh, first minutes are critical in your presentation. So the way that I, I, I like to divide it and even the way that I like to understand pitches that I'm, I'm giving to, it's uh, the first phase, it's uh, understanding of the problem, uh, understanding of the market, kind of like a frame uh, where you uh, belong. 
Uh, the second phase, it's uh, why you? Tell me about your product. Tell me about uh, your value proposition and, uh, and why you're better than anybody else. In this third phase, it's about execution, right? So now that I understand the market, right? Uh, now that I understand the problem, now that I understand the solution, are you able to execute and how you're gonna execute? So uh, those three elements uh, are essential. Uh, at the end, something that it's uh, about the team and, and all that, that is part for me uh, of the execution. Do you have the team that is able to do what you say you were going to do? That makes, that makes a lot of sense. I often tell people what you're answering in your pitch is why this, why now, why you is ultimately what you're trying to, to achieve. Uh, George, George, what about you? How did you decide what goes first? Yeah, so I, I um, talking to a lot of investors, talking to a lot of audiences, I, I always like to come with it of, of, I totally agree with Gabby, you need to get them early. Um, so I like to start with kind of personal credibility, hence the, you know, th this is my background. I, I am uniquely qualified to solve this problem. Um, and I use that to segue into the problem statement. I, I have been up close and personal in this industry, hence I totally understand this problem as well as anyone. Uh, from there, go into the solution. Uh, you know, what is Honeycomb? What do we do? Uh, depending on the length of the pitch, that's when you start to get into... Uh, you know, how, how do you acquire customers? How do you scale this up? Um, who is the team behind it? Uh, that's when, you know, when the, the how and, the, and the, uh, the how and the what is where you can really start to layer in a lot of things depending on the audience. Um, yeah, so that, that's generally, it, it's kind of start with personal credibility, problem statement, solution. Yeah, I've been hearing, that sounds great. I've been hearing kind of some competing opinions about talking about the competitive landscape. Do you typically include it in a five or seven minute presentation? And yes or no, and how did you determine that? I do, absolutely. And, and again, you don't have to elaborate the full competition. And actually uh, that is essential a component in your value proposition, right? Like, uh, I mean, you can say unlike other solutions that do these, uh, but the competitive solution is your uh, weapon to differentiate yourself among, you know, everybody else. And uh, it doesn't have to be long, depending on uh, what type of pitch it is, right? But even in the just a standard uh, elevator pitch or value prop, it's, uh, it's a little bit about, yeah, we do this, right? We do that uh, unlike other solutions that only um, do this. That's fair. I always like to see it because it tells me that you actually did market research. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Well, that's, yeah. So here's another question of, for the both of you in this situation. Sometimes an investor, some people they've asked here is um, an investor wants your pitch deck before having a meeting with you. Do you send it? And what version do you send? So I have a couple of different versions of the deck itself. Um, if an investor wants my deck, they get the teaser deck. So my, my full pitch deck, including appendix, is, you know, most of it's in the appendix, but it's, it's 30, 40 slides. Um, I will send them kind of a five-page teaser that gets some of the, the high-level stuff across. Nothing crazy proprietary, um, but enough to get them excited and interested to have a phone call. Uh, and then once they get on the phone, they get, they get the full thing. But maybe what are two things that you include just generally? Is it that you're the first? Is it that you have your revenue projection? What is it that you, what's in the teaser? So the teaser, yeah, would not include revenue projection. It, it really is um, kind of the, the, a, a summary of the problem statement, an overview of our product and team uh, and four-ish slides. Got it. That's perfect. Gabby, how about you? Um, I think it depends. Uh, for example, uh, if it's a, um, in, in, because pitching is selling, right? Um, I like to understand, of course, it depends on the stage. Uh, if you are uh, fundraising, it depends on the stage of where you are. So uh, I will be a little bit more skeptical uh, kind of like uh, uh, following anybody that wants to see the pitch. I will do a little bit of uh, betting, uh, make sure that there is the minimum interest 
and you know, right? It's like, yeah, I'll send me your pitch. And uh, there are two, two, two messages. It, um, is it a brush off, right? Or there is a genuine interest of learning more. So uh, a couple of approaches. It's uh, if you feel like uh, it's a little bit of, okay, let me send me something. Uh, I will send just a high level uh, summary with a call to action. If you want to learn more, please let me know. So uh, that way we're not giving everything away as soon as they request it. Uh, on the other side, uh, let's say, yeah, I talked to them uh, briefly. Um, I will send them uh, a shorter uh, version. And also uh, what I've been kind of like a recommending and, and even in sales, this is something that we did. Uh, we try to track whether or not they're opening the deck. So that way you have the ability to, to, to go, uh, kind of like a, to measure the level of uh, interest. And even as, uh, you know, as an entrepreneur, if they're learning uh, kind of like a, what is the profile of someone that is really interested, right? Versus someone that is, okay, send me something. Let's say, for example, if a, hey, send me a, this pitch, you send it through uh, uh, Docsend, right? And, uh, and they never open it, right? You know, uh, do you, it is a learning opportunity. So um, a little bit of, uh, we're talking about pitching, but at some point, everybody's gonna be selling. Uh, when you're selling, uh, that's something, hey, send me a brochure, send me that. Uh, the answer is always no. <laughs> Why is that? Well, because uh, uh, you're missing an opportunity to have a conversation. You're missing an opportunity to have customer discovery. Uh, you're missing an opportunity to uh, tailor that type of presentation or conversation to their needs. Uh, fundraising is a little bit more uh, generic, but uh, we're selling, you know, you gotta know what they're looking for and, uh, and you have to tailor that uh, uh, a deck uh, for them. And I, and I think, you know, not only from the preparing the, the deck perspective, but you know, the two of you talked about making it interactive and it's not that you're just trying to entertain is that what you want them is to have them do a lot more talking so that you understand what their needs are and their perspective and what's important to them so you can start tailoring the following information you're going to share during that pitch to appeal to that Absolutely. Uh, it's like a dynamic response in that moment i've been hearing that a lot from a lot of successful entrepreneurs like the two of you yeah all right, so so that's a really good point. Uh, let's see. In terms of kind of, we're talking about that messaging, right? I think a lot of people or a lot of entrepreneurs have a tough time consolidating the information uh, in order to make it effective and concise and um, yeah, just concise and effective. So how did you, or what's your process or what do you recommend in terms of helping consolidate the messaging? Anyone can go first. That tough. <laughs> <laughs> um, George, you want? I mean, I. You want to go first? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a it's a tough question. I think it's really circumstantial, and and frankly, kind of really depends on the audience, right? So, I when I'm speaking to a room of bankers who know small business lending. I don't, I, I talk about the problem statement very, very differently than when I'm talking with people that have no familiarity with small business finance whatsoever. Um, so so it's, it's a little bit of a challenging question. You know, really, I guess it's start with the audience and figure out you know, what are the things that they will understand and what are the things that they are very likely to not understand and make, it, you know, if it is a three minute pitch, focus on the things that they're not gonna understand and, and really kind of dumb it down as much as possible. Um, the, the goal of any pitch is not to, the goal of any pitch is to, to have more dialogue in almost every circumstance. So really you're just trying to get them interested and excited. You're trying to get them to, to ask those follow-up questions um, so just giving them enough to want to engage with you is, is really kind of the focal point. No, that, that makes a lot of sense. And, and I think I was trying to steer the both of you to talk about sometimes founders spend too much time speaking about this product and like very specific details about the product 
in a pitch, you know, at, at this point, if I'm interested enough, I will ask about it. You know, I will ask, well, let, let me see how it actually works. But there's, there's a nice balance to be struck with describing your product versus really like getting into it too much. All right, so the, the next question is, uh, is it possible to pitch too early? And how do you know? I, 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 it depends of what is early, right? So uh, let, let, let's assume that uh, too early means that the product is not ready, mm -hmm. right? So uh, if we assume that is too early, uh, there are ways to go about it. Uh, if, uh, if it's too early and just start uh, pitching and asking for a million dollars, things are probably not going to go well if uh, you are too early. But there, are, but, uh, but there are ways to go around that, uh, which is to start having the conversations. And instead of pitching, it's asking for advice because you're not ready, because you are too early. So it's, uh, it's a little bit more like... Uh, you know, I want to get your opinion. Uh, you know, I want to get your feedback about what I'm putting together and, uh, and, and spark their interest and align the next step, which is uh, based on the feedback. So the next time in two months, I would love to uh, get back to you. So there are ways to, to do it. Uh, in terms of too early, there is never too early to start uh, having uh, conversations, uh, customer discovery. Uh, but I, what I think is essential is to be absolutely honest uh, uh, where you are in, 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 because that's how you build trust. Yes, yeah. there are a lot of uh, entrepreneurs who at the end of it, I think that they've already built the whole platform. And then I realize like, no, they, they don't have any of it. It's just, it's on a, it's, it's written out and I feel mis, you know, misled. Makes a lot of sense. George, did you have something to add that was different? I was just going to say, you know, kind of building on that, it, it is absolutely going out to investors and asking them, what are the metrics you would want to see to invest in a business like this? This is the thing I'm building. If I came back to you in six months, if I checked these boxes, you would invest in my business and get that, get that in writing. And then you can go back to them in six months and say, hey, I did all the things that we talked about. Um, are you interested in investing now? And, and that, that is a huge, that, that's a great way to be in a kind of position of power in, in, that, in that power dynamic of conversation. Yeah, uh, there is this saying that ask for money, you get advice. Ask for advice, you will get money. <laughs> <laughs> that is so true. Wow, that's so well said. It's so true. I mean, particularly now you go try to buy a car. You don't want a guy, the guy doesn't sell you a car. He's like selling you experience or the woman is selling you an experience. So it's, you got to be smart about that. And more and more, I mean, as I talk to more NBCs and, and, and um, angel investors, they want to invest in the person. They want to also, they're offering like, I want to mentor them. I want to help them. I want to make connections with them. And so that's an easier yes than dollars. Uh, and then you start building that trust and they get to know you, that you're passionate. You keep them posted as like, is it okay if I add you to my stakeholders newsletter? Uh, and they'll see that you're growing and you're making, you're meeting milestones and then they might decide to, to invest in you. So that's, that's great. All right. So the other question we have here from the audience is how specific should your call of action, uh, call to action be? So is it a specific amount of money? Is it more general? Is it just more contact me if you're interested in learning more? I mean, I, I, um, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm an investor uh, as well, and uh, when I, you know, uh, talk to the entrepreneurs, I do want to know what is their ask. So, uh, plain and simple, uh, you know, you're selling a portion of your company, right? So, let me know how much it is. Um, and uh, how specific? I, uh, um, they it has to be a specific. Uh, because, uh, you know, this is an exchange of value uh, for money. And uh, in that ask, uh, at least for me, it shows that you have done your revenue model, your expense models, right? You have a complete grasp of what is your business model. So you can, you know, ask for that. Mm -hmm. George? Yeah, I, I, would, I would say a lesson learned is... Um... 
especially when not talking about investors, but other stakeholders. I think a, a, a mistake I often made in the early days was too many calls to action. It was, hey, if you want to learn more about our platform, go to our website and recommend a small business and do this and do that. And I, I, it was just four CTAs and, and no one knew which call to action to, to follow. Um, so I, I am a big believer in one simple call to action on, on a pitch. Okay, that makes sense. Was there ever a time that you were giving a pitch and during it, you felt like it wasn't going well? And how did you handle that situation? Did you change, did you change something? How did you tell me of a time or a pitch presentation, whatever it was, a bad pitch? A lot of, I mean, a lot of them, <laughs> uh, of course, right? And, uh, and especially in the early stages, uh, whether you have a new pitch deck or you have a new sales uh, presentation, a um, couple of uh, hacks. Um, if you have a co-founder, uh, be with your co-founder and have your co-founder start reading the room for you. Let's say if you're doing the presentation, uh, you have to be completely uh, concentrated in, in, in the delivery of your pitch. So uh, it's going to be hard to read the room um, or, you know, or, or, or have someone uh, with you to help you to capture that. Um, the, when things are, when, you know, when things are, uh, uh, at least for me, uh, when I don't get anybody engaged, uh, they're not asking any questions, they're uh, nodding, uh, you know that, um, that you know, something is not resonating, right? And this is a lot of practice. This is a lot of uh, uh, preparation. Uh, so you have to pivot and, uh, you know, and kind of like a change, disrupt a little bit the framework, right? Uh, again, this is a, a, a lot of practice, but for example, right? So you know that they're, they're not uh, engaging. You ask a question, right? Nobody uh, has any answer, right? So, and, you know, you can say something like, uh, well, I mean, it doesn't seem like uh, anybody, you know, it's, you know, has uh, much interest or everything is so clear, right? So I think uh, we're done, right? So, I mean, again, this might be a little bit of extreme and there are some techniques, which is, uh, um, what is called it is uh, actually I recommend this book and there is a 15 minute uh, YouTube uh, pitch anything and they talk about uh, a framework uh, control of course when you're pitching you want to be in control of the framework right and uh, so if you are not prepared for anybody uh, disrupting your framework you're gonna get into an endless uh, loop right so a little bit is a, a kind of like a learning uh, through coaching to practicing how you're going to react when things are not going the way you want it. Not because you mess it up, it's because, uh, you know, do, uh, you know, you fail to engage with, uh, with, with this person, but I recommend everybody at least to, and, and I can, I can uh, share with you this uh, 15 minute uh, YouTube about uh, pitching and, uh, and being in control of framework. Uh, those are really great hacks. Thanks, Gabby. George, did you tell us of a bad pitch or any hacks you learned from giving some bad pitches? Yeah, I, I like Gabby's point of, of having your co-founder. Or, or for me, I just I call them my color commentator, like someone who can obviously read the audience, but also if I'm tripping over myself a little bit, they can come in, add a little bit of extra color. Um, sometimes it's my co-founder, sometimes my chief of staff, sometimes one of my directors. So uh, having a trusted person on the call who can jump in at, at any given time to help out a little bit, just give me a moment to think and breathe. Um, and and one thing I like to do, if a pitch is going really long and I feel like I've lost the room. Uh, with the slide deck there, there, we have really clear section dividers. You know, we are leaving this section and going into the next section. I usually will just continue talking through that, but if it feels like I've lost the audience, those are a great opportunity to stop and say, all right, any questions about the problem? Any questions about how Honeycomb works? And just to check in with the crowd and give them an opportunity to provide feedback if, if there is something that's they're not understanding or just not clicking. That's, that's a great point. That's a great point. Um, so kind of- in, 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 in even uh, just to kind of like uh, uh, elaborate a little bit in uh, what George said and uh, 
uh, I think uh, one of the mistakes, uh, you know, when we are all learning uh, pitching, selling, and all that, uh, it's make it all about ourselves, right? It's like a, I have to talk, uh, I have to say it, right? I own it, and it's totally the opposite. So, uh, I mean, you know, when you're winning, when you're doing the less talking. So, um, so it, it's a little bit of kind of like a reverse uh, what we've been told. Right, uh, mm -hmm. going through motions, powerpoints that uh, as opposed to trying to get them to understand your idea, and even uh, um, kind of like I even prime them to uh, anticipate to start building this anticipation. Hey, and can your product do this? And you know that things are going well. That's a, that's a great point. That's a great point. But you know, as we're thinking about these pitches. Should you always say yes to a pitch opportunity, whether it's a VC, a pitch competition? Do you always say yes to a pitch? I mean, I mean, it's like a, do you will always say yes to going out to a date? <laughs> uh, I, 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 I wouldn't, right? So uh, you want to make sure that you know and you have a little bit of uh, understanding of uh, who you're gonna be dating. And, uh, and this is not uh, different. Would you say that's still true if let's say a VC kind of approaches you and you do your homework and you're maybe not sure if you're ready for them or maybe it's your self-confidence imposter syndrome. So is that is your answer the same when it comes to a VC? No, in, 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 if you if you do the homework, right? And uh, in, in you believe in, in and you have a criteria of what makes your ideal uh, investor, right? And, uh, and of course, that is the one that I want to date, right? So, uh, which goes a little bit back, uh, have a clear understanding uh, who is your ideal um, um, a target. And uh, that will make your uh, decision process a lot easier. So you're not second guessing, uh, should I go out with this? Should I go out with this? No, right? So, you know, I want engineers. Okay, <laughs> right? <laughs> That's right. Yeah, and I, I would say, you know, if, if, a, if a late stage VC uh, sends me an email and they periodically do, and I look them up and they, they say, oh, we invest in series B or later, or that we're not at that stage. I'll very transparently follow up with them and say, hey, we are probably a little bit early for you, but I'm happy to start building the relationship if you want to hop on a call. Okay. Um, so I think with, with VCs, generally, I'm going to say yes, uh, you know, assuming they're legitimate, we've done our homework. Um, but but just being open and transparent and, and, you know, again, kind of going back to the conversation about asking advice, not not money. And, and I think what I'm hearing is, is the pitch is a means to an end, right? It's not it's a tool. It's what's helping you build that relationship. It's helping you, you know, make that sale or get that investment or get that awareness or that talent. So thinking about it as like that resume, you know, the resume doesn't get you the job. It's to get, it's, it's not to get you the job, it's to get you the interview and get in front of these people. And so that's what the pitch is all about. So that's great. So um, Nadine, one, one thing kind of like in my personal experience, which you know, I like to say that I made every mistake that it could possibly be done, right? But because of that, right, I learned a lot, hopefully. But um, kind of like uh, in the earlier stages when, you know, we were growing a lot, uh, you get a lot of inbound uh, from private equities, right, to invest, growth investment. And at the be I will get probably two or three inbounds a day, right? At the beginning, I was so excited, right? Hey, you know, we are so important that everybody's calling me, right? And I will take every call, right? Yeah. So what happened was, uh, um, I it was a great exercise because I got to really practice and really understand. So it did serve up uh, well uh, for as long as you knew what the objective was. Right. So I did take a lot of because I want to know what they want. Uh, how do we uh, see it? But uh, later on, I, I almost take none, unless if we will come through a referral. Mm, that's a really good point. That's a good point. So I, I want to switch to a little bit from that business section. A lot of people, you know, the founders can talk about the product and, and what that looks like. Usually they're the, the software developer. They're the person who is able to build that 
product and they turned it into a business. What, what do you include in your business section? What do you make sure you include there or, or let someone know about your business? Is it the pricing? Is it, we talked about cost, customer acquisition. Tell me more about your business section. So right now we, we do not spend a lot of time on, on features of the product. Um, we're, we're fortunate, right? We're, we're not creating something totally new. People are relatively familiar with the idea of crowdfunding. And so we're, we're standing on the shoulders of giants. We, we don't need to explain the nitty gritty of how crowdfunding works. So we, we really don't spend a ton of time on the nuts and bolts of how Honeycomb was built or the technology or, or specific product features. We have all of that and a lot of it's available in, in the appendix if people wanna go there. Um, but instead we really focus on um, customer acquisition scalability, um, unit economics. Uh, I think those are kind of the, the three main things where we spend most of the time. So we, obviously they, they, we want to talk a little bit about the product. Um, it's a good way to, you know, that, that if you're in a competitive industry where feature by feature is your differentiator, then you need to spend more time on that. Um, but you know, it, our, our feature that differentiates us is the fact that we're a crowdfunding loan platform, right? Our competitors are banks and, and other more traditional lenders. Um, so the novelty of our product is in kind of the very nature of the product itself. So we don't need to go as deep on the features. Um, if you're competing on features, that's when you need to spend more time talking about them, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's exactly what I was asking for is when you're not talking about the product, but the actual like business model component and you narrowed it down really well. It's the unit economics, the scalability and your customer acquisition is really that business part of your company that you include in your pitch. So what about for you, Gabby? What should people include in that um, business section? Um, are we solving uh, uh, your problem? So uh, I, I do agree, uh, you shouldn't be talking about ben uh, uh, features. It's all about uh, the benefits of your solution. Um, yeah. Yeah, and leave the, like to, to George's point, the features can be in the appendix if someone's really curious or we get there in the Q&A. Yeah. And so speaking of the Q&A, what are some kind of mistakes you've made in the Q&A and some, some hacks or tips in handling that? You're like, where do I start? <laughs> yeah, I, I think uh, exactly. But I think um, <laughs> it, it's trying to talk uh, talk too much. Let's say you're you're addressing. Um, uh, I mean, they asking uh, you for something, and in uh, and kind of like a, a, you know, we try to answer with the kitchen sink, right? And uh, and yeah, I think uh, that that's something you know that I that I learned. And uh, you know, be very uh, um, precise uh, with your answer, and making sure that you know during this session we are really uh, answering what they're what they want to know. Um, of course, be very you gotta be very knowledgeable about the problem, but it's um, don't keep elaborating and keep adding and keep adding, right? And I think that's uh, something that I learned. Yeah, and I, to build on that, I don't assume you understand why they're asking a question. I think that's when I get tangled into just like speaking forever, is if I assume that their motivations are X, I will start explaining three levels deeper on X, when in fact they, they were going in a totally different direction with that question. And so I often will ask clarifying questions before I answer. Uh, that, that's one way to, to handle it. Um, but yeah, keep keep it short and let them ask follow up questions. Uh, and and if you're unclear if you answered their question, just confirm if it if you did or not. That makes a, that makes a lot of sense. If you were to bring down your pitch into like a a skeleton, so like let's say if everyone here got off this call, they're super energized to revisit their pitch or to build one, and it's like we're talking about a slide one, not a verbal one, a two minute pitch, but a slide one. What should be 
the headings for the next for the five or 10 slides they should have for their pitch. So you got title, problem statement. I uh, a little bit of what I said, right? Uh, three phases. Uh, um, problem that you're solving, uh, frame uh, your uh, company within the market, uh, you know, market size, uh, talk about the solution and how you are uniquely qualified uh, to solve the problem, and then a couple of slides on execution, a uh, little bit of uh, go to market um, um, strategy, and um, in, in, in the team. Would you say the same thing, George? Yeah, very similar. I was actually pulling up my pitch deck as as, uh, as she, Gabby was speaking, and, and and yes, I think it, it it's it's very similar to that. It's problem statement, our solution, uh, kind of where we're at with traction today, and why that will continue to accelerate. Great. So I've got a question here. How did were you always good at delivering pitches? Or did you have to improve that skill from a public speaking perspective? And were there was there ever a time where you said, wow, I'm really bad at it. I need someone else on my team to do it instead? How do you know if you suck at pitching? <laughs> you need to get someone else. Well, I, go ahead, please, Gabby. No, no, I think, uh, um, and, and, I mean, a little bit of my background, I, when I, came to this country, I didn't even know how to speak English, right? If anyone but was at a disadvantage at pitching and selling, it, it was me. Uh, but I think um, with good preparation, uh, having a, a, a solid uh, storyboard and knowing exactly uh, the value that you add and what you're gonna, I, I have a rule. Every pitch, every, every, every slide, uh, it has to have a punchline. Right, there has to be one value of every in every slide. If it doesn't, eliminate it, right? Because you don't need it, right? It's a filler. So, uh, I mean, and there is this: the more you do something, the better you get at it. Uh, I believe, as a founder, as a as a, 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 a as a CEO, we pitch for a living. So you have to uh, do your best. Uh, to 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 master that because that's what we do. So uh, whether you have an accent or no, whatever, um, you have to do it. When do you know um, that um, if it's not working? I there are two things, right? It is how solid your uh, story is, right? How um, how consistent are you delivering uh, that? And uh, in the other, it's, uh, you know, kind of like uh, your personality, how engaging uh, it is. And uh, to do that well, uh, you have to be very deliberate and doing a very good content uh, in, in the very effective uh, in delivering. And if you're, if, if you're not closing, uh, you know that you have to go back and understand what is going wrong. Mm. Was there someone in your kind of personal board of directors, your team, or an honest friend who told you, hey, this is going well or not? Was there ever someone you always pointed to? <laughs> what am I doing? And uh, I mean, yeah, and, uh, you know, we had a team, but also I think uh, the, the, I was super critical of myself. Uh, you know, I, I knew exactly that this didn't go well. And in, uh, in the things that I needed to do to to fix it, and uh, and you get up and you do it again, and like uh, George said, you do it two thousand times again, right? That's true. George, how did you start off? Were you this good of a public speaker? No, and and, and you know I I'm naturally a pretty introverted person and and don't like to pitch. I've I've gotten used to it, um, so I, I think it is a skill that anyone has the ability to build over time understanding that does take a lot of time and energy um at the, in the early days especially it was just entering any pitch competition we possibly could um a, a, anyone that would have us uh and, and you know the, we, we started while we were in, in grad school so through 
through the school, we were able to do a number of pitch competitions. We were fortunate enough to, to join Alpha Lab and, and just kind of constantly refine the pitch there. Uh, and, and my co-founder has kind of been a constant sounding board. Uh, he's been someone and everyone needs someone like, like Ken who just offers really candid, honest feedback. Uh, and, and he really helped me dramatically improve uh, as I was going through these competitions and other venues to, to practice the pitch. Exactly. That, that's um, we we don't we don't we cannot build everything ourselves, and that's a little bit of uh, uh, you have to find like uh, an incubator or a mentor that is going to help you to refine and get better uh, at pitching. Because I mean, uh, nobody's a natural a hundred percent, right? I mean, probably there are a small percentage, right? But uh, for most of us, um, you know, uh, having some help, I wish that I had a little bit more support uh, back in the day. And, uh, but because I didn't have these, you know, mentorships and, and all these programs that you all have available today, I, I, I think I read every single book uh, there was out there. So you, you have to find a way to, uh, in the tools uh, to, to be able to improve yourself. But more importantly, being at the two ends uh, you know, of the spectrum, right? Um, your best pitch, it's when you are absolutely honest and truthful. And uh, that comes out, um, investors know it, everybody knows it. And, uh, and, and yes, that's, uh, that, that's something that uh, it should be included, uh, being passionate and be absolutely um, honest and humble, why not? It's absolutely true. It, I, think, uh, I, I think there is a way for people who don't know how to pitch look for frameworks and then they try to fit their personalities in the frameworks. No, the frameworks are, are guiding but you need to figure out well, what makes sense for your, are you a high energy person? Or are you kind of like a stern? Is it whatever? Uh, but yeah, you have to figure it out because they're also investing in you, whether as a customer or as a you know, potential venture. That makes a lot of sense. Is there a pitch either of you have seen that is very memorable to you that someone else gave and, and what about it was memorable? I, 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 I've been in front, I've done and again in front of, uh, you know, a number of pitches, but uh, I, I will, I, I will go back to, uh, I don't think there is one that absolutely, you know, captivated me, but the, the, the ones that I do uh, um, remember and, uh, and really created a great impression on me, were the ones where uh, honesty, uh, you know, uh, comes out. When you ask a question, they're not kind of like a trying to give you this super duper answer, right? So they just give you a very honest and, and, and truthful. So uh, that, that's what resonates. Uh, uh, and, 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 and the other, it's, uh, you know, memorable is also that they really have a good understanding of the market uh, in, in, in the problem that they're solving. And, and you can see that. So again, there is no one, but those are the elements that uh, make it you know, uh, important for me. And Jordan, yeah. go ahead. No, I was gonna say, I, I can't think of any in particular, I'm thinking through kind of the, the Alpha Lab and, and the cohort before me and the cohort, my cohort and the cohort after me and, and uh, there are quite a few that, that really stood out. And, and I think one of the unifying themes, I agree with Gabby, it's, it's that authenticity and it, it's, it's kind of poise and confidence and a, a belief that that person understands this market to a point that they will figure it out. They don't have all the answers today. No one expects them to have all the answers today, but they are dedicated to this problem they know a heck of a lot about it and they're gritty and they're going to figure out how to solve it. Like th those, when that shines through, like that's when a pitch connects for me. 
Um, so what's one thing as a call to action for people participating here that they should either uh, do, ask themselves, or read after attending this uh, event? I mean, I would say um, preparation is key. Um, work with a coach or with a, um, a team that can help you uh, to prepare uh, for that and uh, make it your own. Uh, we're always looking for the template. We're always looking for the silver bullet, right? And, uh, and even, you know, the companies that are mentoring, right? Uh, you know, they, what, is the, what is the ideal template? Right? So that's why I don't talk about kind of like uh, the, the template. It's a, what are the elements that should be in there? Make it your own uh, and, and let your uh, personality uh, shine. Um, I'm all for make it memorable and, um, and very, very important. A pitch, it's something that it should be simple to understand and uh, try to create a pitch like a are. Uh, writing a child's book. So if your mom, if your grandma can, a mother can understand it, uh, you know that you have a good pitch. So we try to overcomplicate and make it super technical, right? So again, yeah, there, I mean, there, there would be a place for that. George mm -hmm. has a hard stop at five. So I just want to make sure he got his tip in before he has to go. So I, yeah, totally agree. Keep it really simple. Don't use acronyms. Assume, whenever you're a startup founder, you don't appreciate you have become one of the foremost experts on the thing that you're doing. You, you, you know more about the thing you're doing than virtually anyone on the planet. So you have to make sure you're dumbing it down for, for your stakeholders, whatever the pitch is. Um, the other thing, I, and I, I've alluded to it a couple of times, I am a huge believer in the appendix. If you're debating if a slide goes in your deck or not, it should be in the appendix. Um, we, we have 20 to 30 slides in our appendix. I know them cold. I'll be in a conversation internally and I'll say, that's a great appendix slide. If someone brings up a good point, that becomes an appendix slide. Um, use that as a tool that recognize not everything can be in that pitch. You've only got five minutes or 10 minutes or 15 minutes. That is, that is your arsenal where you can have all the other things you wanna talk about, but you don't have time to talk about. And if someone's interested in it, you can flip to a really cool slide and geek out with, with this a stakeholder because they're also interested in it. Perfect, perfect. Thank you. Thank you to the both of you. I'm so grateful for your advice. Uh, don't, don't leave yet if you're in one of the breakout rooms for some pitch feedback. Uh, but George and Gabby, the two of you, I was so looking forward to this conversation. I'm glad we got to have it today. So thank you so much again for sharing your knowledge.